Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and Tommy's Week. And if you follow military history on social media or you at We Have Ways Fest, you will have seen today's guests' frequent posts about the British 52nd Lowland Division. To talk about their campaign in Germany in early 1944 is Andy Aitchison, who is one half of the Lowlander podcast. Mary and the other half is watching. I just saw in the sidebar. If you're not uh, sure what that podcast is, it's brand new. There's a link to it in the description below. If you like hearing about the 52nd today, you can continue straight after this by diving into their first um, podcast. Without further ado, I'll bring Andy in. Good evening, Andy. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm very well. So we just a little pre-chat there about... Yeah. Anybody who who studies a unit that isn't the SAS stroke parachute regiment stroke 101st Airborne, how yeah. finding a market for it is a little bit trickier because people like what they like. They like dam busters. They like you know yeah. certain units. So, for in your case, how did you first get interested in the 52nd, and how much of a struggle is it, or is it not a struggle to kind of talk about a unit that isn't in that mainstream area? I mean. I mean, I can talk about it as long as you want, but it's just whether people want to listen or not. And I think that's the challenge. And I think the, the good thing about Twitter and, and YouTube and things like that is you can just put stuff out there. And if somebody picks it up, that's great. But as you said, I mean, in terms of commercial sort of uh, commercial ability, it's not really <laughs> what people want to speak about. Well, maybe we'll change the minds tonight. I don't know. Um, I mean, how do I get into the 52nd? Oh, God, that's a question. It sort of came out of lockdown like a lot of these sort of harebrained schemes and ideas. I mean, I'd had the book with the jocks for years. I'd, I'd, I'd got it when it was first published. And that's kind of your way into the 52nd. And then as lockdown sort of happened, I had a lot more time to look at some of the, the various different histories. Uh, I like 21st Army Group, uh, you know, Northwest Europe. And I, re I picked the book up again and then started joining the dots between that and the 52nd Division, which I hadn't really looked at. And it kind of snowballed from there. And of course, because of the online community that yourself is part of, the We Have Ways team, um, all of a sudden you started, I started having conversations with people that know how to do that. So I would have never have gone to the National Archives. Um, but, you know, you speak to somebody and they say, oh, yeah, this is what you do. You go in there and you mm. can see the war diaries. And I didn't even know that. So it's kind of snowballed from there. And, and what you realize is, is once you start getting into it, you start joining the dots up and then you start having your own ideas about what they are and what they can do. And then you just want to tell them. In my case, I want to tell people about it, maybe a little bit too much in some people's opinions. Um, well, I that's, mean, that's the joke, isn't it, that you don't ever shut up about it, but that's why you're here. And I mean, yeah. I think the thing is, we'll discover it's that it's filling another slice in of the story, you know, that yeah. the pie that is the British army in Northwest Europe, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the attention is on the, you know, the, the, as we said earlier, the airborne and bridge too far and those elements, but there's so much more of the pie that is part of the story, part of the liberation. Yeah. And it's filling in another little gap there. And as you say, I mean, there's always someone there who is prepared to listen to these stories and it's, it's maybe mm -hmm. not a massive audience like what I'm doing here on this channel compared to some, but yeah. it's gratifying that the, the people who are interested will, will support, people like yourself who yeah. just devote this time to it. But anyway, we, we can sit here chatting about your <laughs> orange. We'll bring up the PowerPoint and you're in charge. And um, okay. folks, fire away with questions. Um, and there's lots of directions this can go because the 52nd had all sorts of obscure bits of kit and uniforms that some other units didn't have. There's there's rabbit holes aplenty potentially tonight. But I'm going to oh. hand over to Andy to take us through this story. Oh, we've got rabbit holes. Uh, oh, yeah. So we're going to talk specifically. It's, it's Tommy's week or Jock's week, as I would prefer to call them. Of course, Tommy's... <laughs> In Scotland are called jocks. And of course, the, the thing about the 52nd and all the Scottish divisions is by the end of the war, it's well over 50% English. And they get called jocks as well, because that's what happens. You get called jock because you're in a, in a jock division. We're going to focus particularly on the 4th Battalion of the King's Own Scottish Borders. Um, and I came to that, we mentioned Peter White's book, With the Jocks, which is the kind of the standard text for a young officer's battle in Northwest Europe, because he was a part of the 4th Battalion. And through that book, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, you can start thinking, well, what is the battalion? Who are the characters in the battalion? And you start finding out their stories. And then it adds more and more layers to the words that Peter and the, 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 the pictures that Peter drew in the book. So we're going to look at the 4th Battalion. But it was actually really, really lucky that Dermot was on a couple of days ago talking about Operation Veritable, because that's exactly where we're going. And it's this is a really uh, a little known part of Operation Veritable. It's not as sexy as the, the opening days of Veritable, those huge artillery bombardments and pretty much almost the entire British army trying to squeeze through the Reichswald forest. Mm. This is actually quite a few days later, once things start to go a little bit wrong and they want to try and do something to try and 
free up some of that movement because it's such a congested battle space. So we're going to look at the 4th Battalion. So as I said, um, uh, before we go on, uh, I just I thought I'd do a shameless little plug because we, we're on here. Uh, please listen to the Low Under podcast. We talk about African Woods. We talk about Veritable. It's on Apple, uh, Spotify, and Google. Myself and Merrin Walters. And what it is is the 52nd Lone Division produced uh, a, a newspaper every single day they were in combat. They had their own reprographic machine and they issued it out to the guys. And it's a huge range of stories, anything from politics all the way through the football scores. So we launched the first one yesterday and we're going to do it every week until May the 8th next year. So it comes out every week. Um, so uh, we do talk quite extensively about Operation Veritable as well when we get to February time. Um, so so if you can if you can bear with us until then, you'll get some more Veritable stuff. And actually, the other thing I was going to say, where, where it led to is getting involved in the 52nd Lowland Division got to the point where using Peter's book, using the war diaries and triangulating all the stories is now wanting to share what that looks like on the ground. And if you want to talk about Tommies and you want to talk about jocks, it's such a cliche. You've actually got to get onto the ground yourself and have a walk and find things. And I'm going to show you some of the things we found in the way. By all means, if you would like to join us next year, next October, go to walkingwiththejocks.co.uk. You can join us. You can come with myself and Merrin and the amazing guys at Battle on this Tours, Jules and Clive, they're involved as well. Fantastic guys, really good quality touring. I know that's that's a particular thing that you're interested in. Yeah, you can't go wrong with Jules and those guys. Yeah, yeah Merrin, exactly. So, yeah. But but actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of shoot myself in the foot here. If you've got a little bit of cash, and I know things are difficult, get yourself out there. Whatever your interest is, it's actually not that far. Three hours away, you can be right in the heart of Veritable and the battles that were going on there. So I'm not going to do any more shameless plugs anymore. We're going to hit the ground running, and we're going to produce, I think, my favourite map uh, of the Second World War. This is the Canadian official Canadian Army uh, map of Operation Veritable. And it kind of gives you an indication as to why Operation Veritable starts to go wrong. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to crack a nut with a sledgehammer, but you're swinging the sledgehammer through a pint of treacle. It's really difficult. You're trying to squeeze the entire, oh, the best part of the British Army and the Canadian Army into this very tight battle space. And I'm not going to go into the whole details of air at all. Dermot's is a really good uh, 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 video to watch if you haven't caught it, uh, which, he, which he did the other day. It just shows you that, you know, actually things start to go wrong. The weather turns against them. They're bogged in. They clear the rice fold, but they've got to take cleave. And then they're trying to get take Goch. Now, um, it's 30 core plus the Canadians who are clearing up more towards the Rhine River itself. And they had earmarked the 52nd Lowland and the 43rd Wessex to be the exploitation division. So once they'd cleared all the things, according to Horrocks, absolutely ridiculous timescale, they were going to break out into the Rhineland proper and they were going to exploit through the guards armoured and, and all that sort of stuff. Kind of the stuff that they thought they would have learned from Normandy, but they didn't. But maybe that's another maybe that's another live stream altogether. <clears throat> and so they deploy 43rd Wessex actually a couple of days earlier than, than perhaps they were wanting to because they're trying to get close to Goch, which is the big city there. You can see it on the thing. I've got my I've got my little laser laser pointer here, which I'll, I'll, I'll bring up. Yeah, just not there. So we've got uh, if I can get it up. There we go. Pointer. There we go. Yeah, so we've got Goch there. And that's from about the sort of 15th, 16th of trying to get into Goch, and it's already bogging down. Uh, the, the city had been bombed, and they have elements of 7th Falsham Jaeger Division, the German Paratroop Division in there, and they're making it very, very difficult. So what they decide to do then is, well, look, maybe we've got a little bit of room to the, the southwest in this open territory around about here. Let me just get on there around about here. And this is the kind of area we're actually going to be looking at. There's a little green patch down there. Hopefully you can see it in your screens, which is called Afferton Woods. And it's just next to the um, east bank of the River Mass or the River Meuse, depending on where you are. And what they're going to do is they're going to try and pass 52nd Lowland Division through that and swing around and sort of envelop the southern, southern part of Goch to try and put pressure on the Germans. And hopefully that will get them to pull out of there, which frees up um the divisions attacking from the north so that's the idea uh, and what they do is the 52nd cross the river Meuse at Gennep on around about the 15th 16th and the division gets ready and they start to move south and we're going to focus on this area now he says so that little green patch we looked at there this is what it looks like on here this is the original um map overlay that was used by the 52nd Really good map, lots of quality. It's not great in reproduction, so I've stuck, stuck the names of the carriers on there. 
And this is the initial plan for the 52nd Lowland Division for the 17th of February. So the fighting is going on up in Gough and actually just off the page there, that is the outskirts of Gough. And what they're going to do is 157 Brigade and 155 Brigade of the 52nd, they're going to clear the forest and they're going to completely clear it. So what they then can do is the remainder of the brigades, four KOSB and five, or oh, sorry, six HLI are going to pass through them and head up towards Grutterhorst and then the Customs House, which is on the German-Dutch border. I should point out that is where the Siegfried line as well. So it's lots and lots of things. <clears throat> So the idea is they're going to move through. The 52nd Recce Regiment is going to hold Rempill, but they're not going to go south of this road here. This road here is pretty much the limit of exploitation. They're then going to swing east and they're going to move up there to try and envelop. They're not going to worry about the Germans in this area here. Um, as we're about to find out, that doesn't quite go according to plan. Now, I've put the 7th uh, um uh, division in there. There's some confusion as to which German paratroopers were moving around. Some say it was the 3rd Falschermäger Regiment that was caught, which is not part of the 7th Division, but Schlem's parachute army, the ones that are defending the Rhine, by this point, they're all over the place. There are sort of divisions in, in, in proper sort of units, but really, actually, it's, it's kind of a fire brigade type scenario, as you would expect with the Germans. They're trying to sort of desperately plug gaps, and when the 52nd pass through here, they pass through this forest. Um, so on the 17th, they launched the battle, 5 HLI, 7th Ninth Royal Scots, 5 KOSB, and the Recce Regiment. There are some other uh, battalions that are involved, but they don't really get involved too much in the fighting. And like so much that happens in Operation Veritable, things go wrong from the start. They actually start the attack around about midday, which is unusual for the British Army. Normally, they like to start first thing in the morning. And they start to enter the woods and start to clear the woods. Now, if you look at where the woods are there, this is kind of well-known forestry ball. Anybody who's served in the British Army will look at that and shudder. That looks like a, a forest plantation. And that's exactly what it is. This is called the Broder Bosch. And unlike, say, for example, in Band of Brothers, where you've got the Bois Jacques, where you've got those mature sort of pine trees where you can see for miles through the straight trees, <clears throat> these are all immature. They're, they're, some of them aren't even more than 10 years old. So it's actually more like sort of large, bushy Christmas trees. So the vision is reduced almost to like jungle sort of uh, standards. You can't really see more than a few meters ahead of you. And if you notice in that woodland there, there's lots of little rides, lots of little fire breaks. And what happens is the, the, the Falschermäger in there, the German paratroopers in there, break down into groups of one or two guys, a machine gun, a couple of Panzerfausts, and they just set up little ambushes all over the woods. And it, it starts to break down the cohesion with those those battalions that are trying to pass through it. Incidentally, the, the tanks of nine Royal Tank Regiment are in support, and very quickly they start to get knocked out. And actually, later on in the war diaries, the 9RTR actually complained to 52nd Lone to say, your infantry aren't supporting us well enough in this, and that's why so many of us have been knocked out, which is a little bit awkward when you're the, uh, when you're the biggest fan of the 52nd Lone Division to, mm. to admit that. But yeah, so that starts to bog down. Now, 7th and 9th Royal Scots, the guys in the middle there, they're, they're, the, uh, they're in the same brigade as 4th Battalion. Their job is to capture this farm building called Nonhus. Now, they start to move towards it, and it's initially just a, a, a platoon uh, objective. When they get on or into to near that Nonhus farm, towards late afternoon, early evening, as it's starting to get dark, they realise it's a network of concrete bunkers and in-depth positions, because this is sort of the outer edges of the Siegfried Line. And very quickly, the, the battalion gets sucked into this battle to try and uh, capture it. Now, the issue with this is that the that point there is where the 4th Battalion is meant to pass through on the following morning to do this really long attack onto the Customs House at Sigebenwald. Um, actually, um, because that uh, because that gets sort of bogged down very sort of within the late evening and, and, and into the night, they have to put a halt on the, on the 4th Battalion's attack. Actually, the guys in the 4th Battalion are quite happy with this because if you see the distance that they're meant to attack from here all the way across this open ground towards the custom house, they, they, they realise that this is probably a little bit over their over their abilities and expectations. Um, and this ground that you see in between the Broderbosch and the custom house, that is completely flat. That is what you would expect the Netherlands to look like. The Broderbosch itself is slightly higher ground. It's woody, but that area there, it's cut with numerous ditches, and uh, streams and all sorts of stuff. So it really would have been horrible to attack across. So what happens is just before 12 o'clock at night, 
The word gets back to Brigade that 7th and 9th Royal Scots have not captured Mullenhaus and that the objectives for 4 KOSB have to be cancelled. And in the space of about an hour, the brigade comes back to them and say, we're going to change everything. We're not going to do that anymore. What we're going to do is we're going to send the 4th Battalion south through the woods and we're going to cross the open ground across the road, which I pointed out earlier. And I'm going to show you where that looks like in a minute. Now, you can imagine this. Um, they, they've got this idea. They've done all the reconnaissance on the attacks in the customs house. They know what they're doing. They've built their plan. And in the space of an hour, by half past one in the morning, that's completely changed. They've done no reconnaissance. They have only seen the map that we've got in front of us now. And I would encourage you all to have a think about how would I plan an attack? And we're going to show you where they're going to attack in a minute. There's no chance to put out recce patrols. There's no aerial photography that they've got hold of. There's no intelligence reports. They're just told, change direction, and now you're heading in that way. And we're going to focus specifically on this area here. So this is the area around the Castile Blainbeek, which was in the title, the little village of Rempeld, and this open ground. And we're going to look at that ground in detail in a minute. But it's about time we sort of introduce the 4th Battalion, which is, I'm sure, why you're all here. So a little bit of a diversion. So who are the 4th Battalion, the King's Own Scottish Borders? Of course, this King's Own Scottish Borders is the Scottish regiment raised by the Earl of Mar way back in the late uh, 1600s um, to fight numerous Jacobite uprisings, originally raised in Edinburgh. Um, the 4th Battalion specifically is a territorial battalion. They were uh, formed in uh, 1908. Uh, along with the Haldane reforms when the territorial army was set up, along with the 51st Highland, they were, they were created at the same time. They went on to fight in the First World War at Gallipoli, and then they also came back over to northern France for the, uh, the last 100 days as part of the 52nd Royal Division. Now, the 4th Battalion specifically is the Borders Battalion. And what we mean by the Borders, obviously the border region of Scotland is this area around here, but specifically this area here, the place that is actually directly on the English border. And this particular part of the world, it's the kind of eastern border region, is very unique. It's got a very unique character about it. It's kind of rolling upland hills. The locals are fiercely, um, fiercely sort of patriotic for their part of the country. They have a lot of kudos attached to them for defending the border against the English for years and years. And of course, a lot of the families that would later be part of the, fifth, uh, the 4th Battalion have got names which you can link back to the border reavers, the, these sort of bands of sort of brigands that would roam across the borders, raiding parties and all sorts of stuff. And the, the recruiting area really is Berwickshire, Roxburgh, Selkirk, Peebles, and even sometimes up into Lothian and Edinburgh. And, and there's is, already been a debate in the sidebar Andy, about whether Berwick is English or Scottish. I just, well, I kept out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the King's on Scottish Borders headquarters is in <laughs> Berwick upon Tweed. If you speak to Jerry, who who runs the uh, runs the museum there, uh, he's a Scot and he he lives in Berwick, and I think he'd probably argue with you. <laughs> I think it's Scottish. It's been it was Scottish longer than it was ever English, but but anyway, that's maybe for another one. But but yeah, I mean, Berwick is, is, is one of the recruiting areas. And they do recruit a little bit across the border. One of the, the eventual commanding officer towards the end of the war actually lived just across the border in Northam. But um, these sort of towns, um, the, the kind of place where they recruited from is one of those sort of classic rural territorial army sort of stories. And it's a real big slice of sort of social history. So a lot of the officers who joined in the late 1930s, they are kind of, um, sort of rich landowning farmers, the kind of yo what you would call a yeoman farmer in the south, um, lots of professional class who maybe work in Edinburgh during the week as a solicitor or a banker and they come back down to their, their family estate in the, in the lowlands and the borders, and they are the officers, and, and, and you'll see that some of the people we meet along here are those guys. Um, and the guys, the senior NCOs are perhaps maybe your shop foreman, maybe the guy that's the manager of part of the textile factory in Hoyk or something like that. So it represents that social class. And of course, the privates on, on, the, on the eve of war, the, the junior ranks, they are the farmers, uh, the guys that work in the factories, all those kind of guys. And it's kind of very similar. I, I know you've spoken to, to James Holland before about the, the Sherwood Rangers. It's very similar to that, the same kind of social structure. It's got the gentry who are the officers, and a lot of them are into hunting as well. A lot of the guys bring the hunting horns. And then you've got the guys on the ground who would work in a factory during the week. And then at the weekend, they go out onto the Pentland Hills and do some exercises and some battle camps. So that's the recruiting area. 1939 is actually the 250th anniversary of the KOSB. And the whole, the whole regiment parade earlier on the year in Edinburgh, the whole regiment is together for the first time probably in a very, very long time. All of the territorial battalions, all of the regular battalions. And not long after that, 
the rumors of war start and they start to do a lot more exercises, a lot more summer camps, and actually they mobilize just before the outbreak of war. And they mobilize at the same time as the 6th Battalion. And we talked just before we came on, on, on air about the 6th Battalion uh, in the 15th Scottish Division. They actually recruit from exactly the same area. And what they do is they have a big discussion at the start. The two CEOs get together and go, right, how are we going to work this out? Because we can't, we can't fight for the same people. And what they agree is the 4th Battalion will take all of the fully trained territorial guys into their battalion, and the 6th Battalion will take any of the new recruits. And once they've sorted that out, then they'll recruit normally. And, of course, the 6th Battalion go on to fight in Normandy at uh, Epsom and Hill 112, 113, all the way through, and actually up into Veritable as well. And, of course, a really good uh, uh, account of that is Robert Wilkins' uh, book, uh, Lion Rampant, and he's a, mm. he's a young officer in the 6th Battalion. So that's the area there. Um, the 5th Battalion, their sister battalion in the, the Kings on Scottish Borders, are recruited from Dumfries, Kirkcubri, and, and Wigtown. Um, we won't dwell too much on them in this one. We're really focusing on the 4th. So on the outbreak of war, they mobilize. They're pretty well trained. Obviously, the equipment standards are a little bit all over the place. But very quickly, they get sent south down to the south coast in England. And the 52nd Lowland, almost completely territorial at this point. They've got some older guys in there, but they've literally got everybody together and they head down south. And while the debacle at Dunkirk is going on, uh, they get involved. The 52nd Lone Division, along with one of the Canadian divisions, gets sent over as part of 2nd BEF, this kind of harebrained Churchill scheme to try and bolster up the French after the, or during the loss of Dunkirk. And what they do is they sail over to Cherbourg in early June, and the division moves down through all those places you'll have heard of, the Cotentin Peninsula, Carentan, um, Veer, all these places that four or five years later will become more important. And they end up in and around Rouen. Now, the 4th Battalion themselves don't actually do any fighting when they're, they call it the Cook's Tour because what they did was they set up camp outside a chateau and they basically just camped and cooked food for a week. 157 Brigade, who are also involved in the in the veritable battles with them, they actually do fighting and they fight along the right-hand side of the French as they're falling back towards Caen. Now, Alan Brooke, who's in charge of them, quickly realises things are not going to go well. So he already starts to, to get them to pull back. And over the space of a couple of days, they pull back up the Cherbourg Peninsula. And of course, the French sign the armistice. And then it's a mad dash back up. Again, the 4th Battalion don't actually fight themselves. The 5th Battalion do fight the rear guard at Cherbourg. And then um, there's the boat at the top. There's the uh, the SS Manxman. That's the ferry that the 4th Battalion and the 5th Battalion take over. Um, the 5th Battalion sustain a casualty on that boat because he's one of the guys is carrying a boy's rifle. He drops it, fires and shoots one of the guys and kills them just as they're leaving the port, which is just one of those weird things that happen. Anyway, the 4th Battalion intact. They've left, they've lost the vehicles, but they all have their personal weapons. They've got a lot of their personal kit. It's not like Dunkirk. They actually get out with a lot of stuff um, and they go back to England and overnight they get the train up to Norfolk. And the 52nd Lowland Division take over um, invasion defence in, in that summer of 1940. And they're the reserve division should the Germans choose to invade, um, the, um, in, invade East Anglia. And actually, the 4th Battalion themselves specifically go to a house called Oxborough Hall, which is just outside of King's Lynn in North Norfolk. And um, it's a Tudor, or multi tudor house. It's an absolutely amazing place. National uh, National Trust, if you get a chance, you've got to visit. It's really lovely. And they actually set up camp there for six, six months, and they spend their time there. And if you look at that top left-hand photograph up there, the man standing there is one of the officers. That man in there is, uh, at the time he was lieutenant, Alan Innes and Alan Innes actually ends up becoming the B Company commander for the attack in Afridon Woods and we got some jocks down there in Oxborough Hall and they set up camp in the woods they do training but the guys really like it because they get to go out for a night out in Kings Lynn once a week uh, and if any of you have been for a night out in Kings Lynn they'll know how exciting that is they have a great time they do six months there and they as well as doing all the training and re-equipping what they do is they have a big clean out they get rid of all the old guys that can't quite cut it. Shame to say a lot of the guys who joined in the territories in the mid-30s, by the time we get to 1940, they're physically not quite up to it and they get sprayed out. So they start to take on more recruits. And of course, one of the main characteristics of the of specifically the 4th Battalion, but the Kings and Scottish Borders, is rugby. And they play a lot of rugby. And the 4th Battalion, I think it's probably safe to say, will have the best rugby team in the British Army. And anybody who knows anything about Scottish rugby, I'm not an expert. Hoyk, 
Melrose, Selkirk, Kelso, that is the heart of Scottish rugby players. And that's the fourth battalion rugby team. That's actually a little bit later on the war, but it just gives you an indication of, yes, it's all all the war stuff, but actually they're also getting out there and doing that. Well, as is, as is being said in the sidebar, it's, you can't understand what these guys do in combat if you don't understand where they come from and yeah. what their origins are and why they fight for each other. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. It is, the, it is that thing that we were talking, again, the... The 4th Battalion is slightly different. In fact, the 52nd is different because they don't suffer the attrition of either Italy or Normandy. So a lot of the officers and senior and so is are still the same ones at the end of the war. And so they have that continuity. And almost all of the officers and senior and so is are local border men from the borders of Scotland. Um, and that maintains that continuity all the way out. They're lucky because they don't have to fight in Normandy. But when things are getting tough, they've got that they've got some of that more cultural and social uh, understanding of each other, which helps them sort of, and we'll talk a little bit about that actually when things start to go a little bit wrong as well. So from there, we're going to get into everybody's favourite subject. They go back up to Scotland in 1941. They do a few months as home defence around the central region. They do a lot of work with the Poles that are there. And then early 1942, let's be honest, things aren't going particularly well for the British Army. We've just been beaten in the des desert at Gazala and Tobruk's fallen. Really, nobody has any idea of what's going to be happening next. Monty hasn't quite got a grip of things in the desert. We don't really know what's going to happen. And so the British Army sat down. In fact, Churchill, I've seen the memo from Churchill. He says, I really think we should have some mountain troops just in case. Typical uh, Churchill, 95% of it's daft and then 5% of it is absolute genius. And he goes, right, this is what we need. And he goes to Allenbrook and he goes to the home defence. He said, right, well, we've got a 52nd Lowland Division up there. We can turn them into a mountain division. And we mentioned Gazala, um, Neil Ritchie, who unceremoniously was sacked. And that's a whole other series of, of live streams and podcasts. He comes in and he takes over the 52nd Lowland. And the 4th Battalion embark on two years of mountain warfare training. They call it mountain in the snow training. And it's kind of, it's sort of a joke, but it isn't. They actually embark on it really seriously and they bring in some Canadian officers, Norwegian officers, a lot of the Norwegians from the Norwegian Independent Brigade and some Czech officers as well. And they actually sit down and they think, how can we develop mountain warfare? Because we might end up in Italy, we might, up, might end up in the mountains of North Africa, we might end up in the mountains of Scandinavia, we just don't know, or even Yugoslavia. And so they develop, they start to build the doctrine and they start to try the equipment and they start to get themselves ready for mountain training. Um, and very quickly, the 4th Battalion starts to outshine them, outshine the rest of the division. Their fitness levels are superior for some reason. They're just very fit. They're hardy border men, a lot of them. And they start to sort of excel at all the tests. And they build up and build up, and they start doing more and more intense training. Now, we've got all the sexy pictures of the skiing and the snow holes and all that. When you actually look at mountain warfare, and, and, and again, probably another discussion, it's all about the logistics. It's not even about the fighting. I think people think about the telemark heroes when you think about Arctic warfare, you know, skiing down a hill, karate chopping Germans. It's not that. What it is, is about how do you supply, support, and maintain an infantry division on a high plateau that's in the snow, in the cold, where your ration scales are significantly increased. You have to take more rations in. How do you get stuff to them? So they've got Indian mule companies, Force K6, um, uh, lots of Punjabi Indian soldiers who are over in the Scotland, Scottish Highlands using mules, they trial new equipment. So it's a really big thing they're doing. And we see there, uh, they've got, these are all the 4th Battalion guys on the left-hand side. These are them doing their ski training. Each company in the 52nd loan, each battalion in the 52nd loan had a dedicated ski company. In the 4th Battalion, it was C Company. And we're going to talk about them a little bit more, although everybody could ski and everybody could climb. Um, and um, while they're there, they embark on all the usual stuff. The rugby team's doing well. The football team's doing great. They're doing lots of exercises. The Colonel-in-Chief of the King's Own Scottish Borders, uh, Princess Alice, the, the Duchess of Gloucester, she visits many times. And that is a company. We're going to see them a little bit later on, and, and they get inspected. And the top picture there is uh, Peter White's drawing. And this was in the Peter White archive. He got there in March 1944, just coming to the end of the mountain training, and he does a couple of exercises with them. And you can't believe what you see. I mean, if you look at that picture, that doesn't look like the British Army of 1944. It's it's kind of much more like a modern army. They've got the camouflage windproof smocks. They've got the, the tents. And it's just a very different feel. Um, 
so that's the mountain training, and we we, we could probably discuss a, another time why it doesn't why they don't end up in the mountains. Really, it's down to Operation Fortitude North, the fifty second Lowland Division. Essentially, there they don't realise this to hold the Germans in position while D Day happens, and they do pin down the, the German divisions in Norway and, and Scandinavia and what have you. Unfortunately, the mountain training comes to an end, and over the space of the summer, they do combined ops training, and then they're, they're transferred to the Allied Airborne Army. And they're given this brand new role. They're given this role of air transportable troops. So we've got your airborne troops, your parachute train troops, you've got your glider troops. And what they realize is a new way of reinforcing those units when they land somewhere, when they take somewhere over, if we can capture an airfield or a runway, we can just fly reinforcements in directly off the, uh, off the Dakotas. And so they spend the summer developing this new concept of warfare under top secret, in the field in Amersham, they, they, they build mock-up Dakotas and they work out all the load plans. They work out how to do it. And the 4th Battalion is assigned as the spearhead battalion of that operation for the whole of the 52nd Division. Because of their fitness levels, because of their attainment tests when they're doing exercises, the division selects them as the lead battalion. So it's a huge feather in their cap. Just to jump in for a second, Andy, because yep. some people watching this would think it's a it's a strange kind of abstract leap to go from being trained for the mountain to then yeah. joining an airborne army. But the principles, as you just said there, are that you've created a group of men that are very good at following instructions. They're physically fit. Yeah. They're good at small unit tactics because mountain training yeah. is all dependent on small teamwork and effort. And, and so it's not, it, although it sounds at first impression, it's a, it's a big leap. It's yeah. not really. It's just the it's the it's the simple concept of training a group of men to be very very good at following the instructions, very very individually good, sort of self sufficient soldiers, yeah. which is exactly the kind of thing you want for any kind of, I suppose you'd call it, emergency firefighting type force. Yes, yeah. and the thing is as well, people people think the British Army is rigid. It's not. It's incredibly flexible. Yeah. It's got such a depth of training. I mean, they've already done the combined ops training, so they're already amphibious trained. We've got that knowledge base where you can attach yourself to an airborne army and you can start to build. So they're, they're incredibly flexible. And also, actually, the divisional equipment, the mountain equipment, lends itself to air operations. So the mountain regiment, the first mountain regiment, which are the mountain artillery regiment, they've got guns that can be broken down and man-packed, which is exactly what the airborne divisions would want. So they've got their 75 mil guns. They can split them down mm. and they can move them. The machine gun battalion, the Manchester's, again, all of their stuff can be man-packed, which is exactly what you want with a, an air assault or an airborne or an air transportable division. And, of course, they've got the windproof smock, which everybody knows about. So you don't even have to issue them Denison smocks. You can let them keep the, the windproof. And something as simple as the Bergen. So the Bergen, which they were issued for mountain training, of course, the airborne and the commando troops are issued as well because it's much more practical. Um, so they develop... Um, the uh, air transport thing, they're, they're primed to go on Operation Linnet, which is the, the capture of um, uh, sort of the, the sort of northwest of, uh, northeast of France, but of course the Great Swan bypasses it and they think, oh, we've missed our opportunity. And of course, lurking on the horizon is Operation Market Garden and they're set to land at Deline Airfield, of course, if it's captured during Operation Market Garden. And when we say the 50 seconds going to land at, at, at during Operation Market Garden, we actually mean a reinforced and strengthened 4th Battalion. So they'll have the Mountain Division with them. They'll have a scratch brigade headquarters. Closely after them will be 7th and 8th Royal Scots. But the 4th Battalion really are the lead. Now, that's great. They've got it all planned. They go up to Lincolnshire, to all the airfields around there, ready to go. And then they realise that they haven't got enough Dakotas to do it. And what they decide is, in the space of 12 hours, they decide that actually they're going to be dropped in Waco gliders. Not horse gliders. Waco gliders on about the twenty set about the twentieth of, of September, and of course they just dump that on the battalion. And say right, you need to be ready to fly in by a glider this time tomorrow, and it's all hell, but all chaos. All of a sudden they've got to try and work out how do we get the same people into these? They've never been in a glider before. They've never trained in gliders. They've never expecting, um, and it got to the stage where the engines are rolling on the runways. They're ready to go, and thankfully somebody has the good sense to say stop. This is this is this is bad. I mean, I, I'd hate to think the the plan is to land on the island right next to where the poles had landed earlier. I just, I mean, it would have been absolute carnage and, and mm. chaos. And we know what happens to the guys that are involved in that. So, thankfully, sense prevails, and then they are very quickly transferred to a conventional line infantry division, and they sail on the SS Lady of Man over to Ostend in mid October, and. 
whizzing through what they do now. We'll just have a very quick whiz through what they're doing. This is the 4th Battalion's main task. They are the lead, uh, lead assault company after the commanders on the 1st of November of Walcheren. The map in the middle there is the commanding officer's map. So Major, uh, sorry, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Melville, that is his map. It's folded so you can see where he's had it in his breast pocket and he's taken it out during the battle. That is a one to 5,000 map of, uh, of Flushing or Vliskin and Walcheren. Fantastic map, loads of detail. Um, we can see that top right-hand photograph. That's quite a well-known photograph of the 4th Battalion fighting through the streets of, of Flushing on the 1st of November. Now, they, they finish their jobs and it takes a couple of days to clear Flushing and they start to move towards Middleburg, which is captured a couple of days later by the 79th Royal Scots. And then they spend a couple of weeks just refitting, taking in some casualties. They took a lot of casualties in, in Walkroom. And what they do then is they move down southwest, down to central uh, Netherlands, um, to uh, a town called Sertogenbosch, that funny looking word with the S and the apostrophe, right in the middle of, of the Netherlands on the south bank of the River Mass. And they take over the duties of holding the line for a couple of weeks from November into December in waterlogged country with Canadians. They're using their ve the weasels and their, and their boats to get out to patrolling. And the headquarters for the division sets up in Vocht concentration camp, which is just outside of um, thing. And it's an amazing place to go to. It's, some of it is quite well preserved. This is the first time the 52nd would have come up against or come uh, up against the the the, um, the Holocaust. Um, it's a it's an SS barracks and there's torture chambers and all sorts. And they actually set up their headquarters in the barracks. And a lot of the guys from the Fourth Battalion visited it. And it was the kind of first time they came to terms with they'd heard about how bad the Nazis were. Everybody was aware of it. That's why they're in the war. And then to see it in in sort of stark sort of um, uh, vision right in front of you was, was quite telling. And, and Peter White talks about just how chilling it was when they went there. So that happens. And in mid-December, they head south, way down to the south into the Roar Triangle, sort of just near Garlingkirk and Sittard and Roermond. And for about a month, they hold the line over Christmas into the new year, around about the uh, German town of Tripsrat. And the 4th Battalion actually lodged themselves on the 1st of January in Tripsrat. Hogmanay for a Scot is never a good day to be holding the line. And they're in the woods and the Hoverbosch there uh, um, in the woods there. And that's where Peter joins, rejoins the 4th Battalion because he'd been away in the course. And previous to that, he'd been in the anti-aircraft platoon, which air transport divisions had at the time. And that's his picture in the bottom left-hand corner of Tripsrat Woods. And they're dug in the line there. It's very, very cold. There's lots of sniping, lots of German patrol actions lots of artillery and it's a real test it's seven days in sub-zero temperatures dug in very again similar to band of brothers when they're dug into the bois jack and it's here where the fourth battalion suffered its mate this it's really a, its first big loss of the war uh around about the 7th of january um some of the fourth battalion are helping the royal engineers uh, lay a large minefield and about 2300 Hawkins grenades, 75 grenades explode, about, a, about a, a ton of explosives explode, and it kills 17 jocks from the 4th Battalion and about 29 Royal Engineers in one go, and there are no parts left. They are completely vaporised. It's a huge explosion. Peter writes about his book, The War Diary, logs about it. The commanding officer, Chris Melville, is only, a few, only about 100 metres away. He manages to, to duck out the way. Everybody else is wiped out. They actually don't need any medics. They call for the medics to come over. The medics come over and say, we, there's nothing for us to do. They're buried at Brunson. That was quite a big thing. They then move back over to Sittard and they get involved in Operation Blackcock. And those of you who came to um, the We Have Ways Fest talk, I talked about the 4th Battalion's um, counterattack of Valdefoyk as part of Operation Blackcock. Um, Wizarding over that now, um, but it's a really interesting battle. And they eventually capture Heinsberg. The 4th Battalion lead the attack on Heinsberg, and that is the end of Operation Blackcock. And they take a couple of days rest there, and then that is when we come back into Operation Veritable. So we talked about um, we talked about how the Fourth Battalion got here and the kind of characters that are there. This is the day. This is the seventeenth of uh, of February. We talked about uh, Royal Scots bogging down outside Mullen House and the change of plan. And that's what we're going to go into now. What was the plan? What was this plan that came in overnight? And there's the commanding officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Melville. He's actually Black Watch, but he was attached to the KOSB and he led them through the war up until about 90, uh, about March 1945. So he's only been there for another month. Very, very good looking guy. Another rugby player. He played rugby for Scotland, like a couple of other people in the 4th Battalion. 
And he's given these orders at half past one in the morning of the 18th of February. So a complete change of orders. The attack is to go in at uh, 0, 08, 30 hours. So he's literally given them seven hours before. Now he has to readjust his battalion and reissue orders out. By this point, the 4th Battalion are actually dug in on the start line right about where the, the unit symbol is there. They're actually just waiting for one to go. Just a couple of questions word. about about those previous months and around yeah. Garnenkirk, and but very similar. So, uh, uh, Roshent is saying, was the morale still good after being in Germany to go back to the Netherlands? Might look like a setback because they kind of move from one front line because operations, <laughs> you know, the operations about Garnenkirk and uh, Operation Clipper, kind of in between the yeah. Hurtgen and the Ruhr, didn't kind of end very well. And, and connected to that question, uh, David is asking. Did the men suffer from the usual cold weather and water immersion of casualties? I can imagine trench foot was a yeah. problem. I, mean, I know they've kind of had that mountain training, but but morale and conditions in those previous few weeks. Yeah, I mean, the weather is, we're going to actually, I was going to touch on that at the end of it, some of the common themes, but the weather is definitely degrading. Now, the only bit of mountain equipment they bring with them, apart from section primer stoves, which they which they, they didn't have to hand back in, they, carry, they bring the Bergen, some of the units have still got the Bergen, and the windproof smock. Right. All the other stuff that would have been absolutely brilliant for a winter in Germany in 1944-45, they have to hand back in. In fact, they're actually the equipment. What they what we find out is the equipment is actually stored in Belgium should they ever need it, but they didn't have access to it. So all the all the kit, which would have been absolutely perfect. So they've got the windproof, which does actually help, and people do like the windproof. It's got a hood, mm -hmm. and it is actually made out of a very fine, um, very very fine cotton, which cuts out the wind, but it's breathable. But yeah, I mean, the, the when they were in the Tripstraff Woods, especially, they were there. Well, they were in around that bottom of, of uh, the Roar Triangle for about a month, and the average temperature probably doesn't get over zero at all. In fact, at some points it goes down to about minus ten, and you get a lot of cold weather injuries, a lot of immersion foot. You get people that just have to be taken out of the line. The fifty second Lowland Division, actually, and if, if you listen, this is a shameless plug for the Lowlander. We actually talk about they were very good at setting up club rooms behind the front lines when they're in static positions so guys can get away and actually you do see and peter talks about maybe moving one of these guys back there for a little bit to do a job somewhere behind the lines and it's because he's one of his best guys but he just needs a rest so the the, the it's definitely an issue and, and and especially coming into the spring because it's now starting to thaw things are getting wetter yeah it's a different when it's cold and it's dry, but when it starts to get wet, that's really, really bad. A lot of this yeah. is, I mean, it's a, it's a big rabbit hole, but a lot of this is not so much the temperatures, how the men deal with it and mm. well, whether they're well instructed to change their socks mm. regularly, yep. dry their feet out and that, you know, use of foot powder. And you see that across, I'm yeah. thinking of the book Sheer Misery uh, about yes. Americans that yes. winter is some of the units just dealt with it better because they had yep. better courses, their officers were better prepared for it. And they and they sent that message down yep. of foot care and drying things out. And, it, you know, the equipment makes a difference. But common Just sense discipline. and doing yeah. it the discipline is is far more important yeah that's definitely fine and of course they've got that they have got that um discipline from the mountain training where you have to do certain things to offset frostbite and, and, yeah. and all the rest of it so this is the plan now i'll just talk to you very quickly through this we're going to go into the ground detail so this is the african woods this is what they call african woods but it's actually called the broader bosch and there's this road here which leads from renfeld and Aferdon all the way up and that heads up to gok so that's the gok african road this area here is very low lying, it's very flat, and we've got two anti tank ditches. We've got an anti tank ditch that runs down this river here, you can just about see it. it's a little bit smaller, and then you've got the main anti tank ditch here, which runs just forward of this high ridge line here. This is the area which they're going to attack across, and we've also got this feature here called the Castile Blame Beacon. We're going to talk a bit more of that in a minute, but this is the essential plan. What's going to happen is two companies are going to go out and secure the anti tank ditches. The lead company, B Company, is going to pass through them and capture this high ground to the south. No reconnaissance is done. They have no idea what the Germans are down there. They know they're probably the 180th German Division, um, Infantry Division, but we don't know in what strength. It really is a, a bit of a blind attack. Um, just to point out where we think the German positions are and actually confirmed, um, there's some conflicting reports again about which Falchion Regular are there. There definitely are paratroopers. They, they captured some paratroopers from 3rd Falchion Regular Regiment, but the 7th uh, Falchion Regular Division is cutting around that area, and they're, they're definitely in and around there. And there is a, probably about an understrength company of them in the Castile itself. Um, the main line, though, along this ridge line here, and we're going to look at this in detail in a minute, is elements of 1221 Grenadier Regiment of the 180th Division. And I think I think actually Dermot mentioned them uh, the other day. 
they're the kind of standard German infantry division at this this point of the war. Um, lots of young guys, lots of old guys, but still effective. They've still got good equipment. They've got good training. They've got good discipline. There's also a number of anti-tank guns, and some of those are self-propelled. And, and there's a self-propelled anti-tank gun roaming around this bit here, covering the anti-tank ditch. And crucially in this part, because it's sort of so linked with the Siegfried line, there are a number of batteries of Nebel Werfers, the Screaming Mimis, the, that, that <clears throat> psychological weapon, but also it's, it, it's not very nice when those rockets land near you. And they are built, dug into this high ground to the south. Now, I knew there was an aerial photograph of this because in the book Mountain Flood, they've got a cropped version of it. And could I find it? I've spent years trying to find it. And two weeks ago, I went into the National Archives. I opened up one of the Royal Engineer Diaries and right in front of me was the aerial photograph of the area. I could not believe it two weeks before this presentation. So you just saw the map there, just to orientate your ground. We're going to show you the overlay of this in a minute. Um, there we go. There's the way the units are picked. So it's almost identical to the map. And I've highlighted the anti-tank ditches. This is where the jocks are going to come from up there. I'm going to cross this open ground. When you see it like that, you see how open the ground is. Mm. That little patch of forest there, you can actually see the shadows from the trees and how sparse they are. This area is completely open. And what you've got here is this high ground, this high sandy ridge line here. It's almost like a bluff, like it's sort of almost Omaha Beach, but not quite as high. This is actually a snake-like ridge. It's not just a bluff. It's actually a ridge. And I'll show you a cross section of that. So it's a perfect defensive position. And of course, we've got the Castile, which can see anything that happens in this area here. I talked about the castle many times. This is the castle itself. It's a, a late medieval uh, castle, which has been sort of um, tarted up into the sort of uh, the late medieval and, and sort of early sort of 17th centuries. It's surrounded by a moat and it's got a little causeway into that building there. And it's got a courtyard there. That's the main building. That's the main tower. And this is a courtyard. If you look down at the original etching of it, that gives you a bit of an idea. That's the causeway. That's the only access into it. You've got this gate here, and this is a courtyard. And then this here is the main door into the main building. So that is the Castile. So as you can see, if you think about its position on the map, it can see the whole area. It's, it's, it's amazing. And again, they've not had time to wreck it. It was going to be one of the objectives for the other battalions once they cleared the woods. But all of a sudden, they give that to the 4th Battalion. Now, you can tell I did geography GCSE. I did a little <laughs> cross-section. Is there going to um, be an Oxbow Lake? Is there going to be an Oxbow Lake? Anna? I wanted to. I was going to. I was going to. I was going to put. The all I remember of a, a low-level <laughs> geography is Oxbow Lakes. I was trying to work out if I could put the intertropical convergence on, but I realised that was a bit too far. No. This is a cross section of that bit we can see at the front. So the the purple lines there represent the the axis of advance for the fourth battalion, and this is the cross section. Now, obviously, it's not to scale. The woods themselves are sort of a high. Um, couple of hundred million year old uh, beach it's very sandy it's like sand dunes the ground itself is very sandy and then when you get into this valley here it's actually low lying and it's kind of mud and silt from what would have been the, the river mass before it was before it was um you know controlled and sluiced and all the rest of it we've got this road this is the road here this is the gok atherton road which is here and the farmhouse and then we've got the first anti-tank ditch now obviously the anti-tank ditch isn't that deep but it's just representative got a slight rise and we've got the final anti-tank ditch which is around about here on the map there and then we've got this ridge line that I was mentioning and it is literally shaped like that it's about three to four meters wide at the top it's made out of sand and it goes up and then down you've got this perfect reverse slope here where you can put your mortars you can have your command post and all the rest of it and this forward edge here sometimes when you do research with and you know this yourself you have an idea of what you're going to find when you go somewhere oh, wouldn't it be good if I could find something? I walked onto this ridge earlier on this year and it was littered with German positions, German dugouts, German trenches, the whole area is covered in it. Um, there's me. I'm looking maybe a little bit too happy considering I'm in a German trench. I probably should have thought about that. But this is a German dugout and I was incredibly chuffed. This dugout was really deep. It was perfect shape and it looked right across over that open ground. Now, nowadays that area is a, is a golf course and it's been landscaped and there's trees everywhere. And you can't see right across it. But at the time from this dugout here, you could have seen any movement from the, the British side of the wood. And this is the top of the ridge line, just to show you. It's the ridge lines there. 
and just in the in the horizon you can see with the British so it's just perfect observation and of course you've got the enemy depth positions behind it as well so this is what the 4th Battalion had got to attack on the morning of the 18th of February. Supporting them are six tanks from 9RTR. That photograph there on the left, the Churchill tank, that is actually 9RTR in the Brodebosch. That's taken on the 19th of the day after. That was one of the few tanks left. And they've also got three Avery Fascines from the 82nd Assault Squadron Royal Engineers. What's going to happen is they're going to support the 4th Battalion. They're going to trot the Fascines into the anti-tank ditches. The tanks are going to roll off and roll over, and the infantry are going to follow them. Fairly basic, standard sort of stuff. I know that uh, again, Dermot talked a lot about the Avries and, and what their job was in Veritable. Absolutely vital bit of kit in here. So let's talk about the actual battle itself. We, we, it's only taken us about an hour to get here. This is the ground. We, we were aware of the things. A couple of units on Air Squadron of the 9 RTR. They are sitting around Rempeld ready to reinforce. We've got uh, A Squadron from the 52nd Reggie Regi Recce Regiment holding Rempel, the village next to the woods. First thing that happens at 0400 hours is A Company and C Company of the 4th Battalion creep out under the cover of darkness, perfectly silent, onto the anti-tank ditches. And they do that there. And they crawl out and they start to dig in. And the idea is they're going to secure those anti-tank ditches before sunrise. What they're meant to do is push out platoon patrols onto the main anti-tank dish as well. Now, where A Company are, which is this bit uh, here, that whole area has become flooded because the Germans have blown the, the dikes on the river, the river mass, so it's, it's started to flood it. So they can't get across onto the second anti-tank ditch. They're just on the first one, just in front of the woods. C Company, on the other hand, they can, and they push a, a platoon-sized group onto that anti-tank ditch there. Now, look how close that is to the German defences. And they start to dig in silently overnight. And they've only just finished digging in as the sun starts to climb up. Now, because of the low-lying nature, because of the weather, um, as first light starts to break, they're in position. But there's a fog that covers the whole of that valley. So the, the, the observation to, to just you know, maybe 20, 30 metres, which is perfect for them. And what they do is they send a, pat a platoon-sized patrol out to the Castile to check to see if it's occupied. Because, of course, they've done no reconnaissance. They don't know. And so a platoon-sized group under Sergeant Welsh, he's in command of the platoon, around about 7 o'clock, they move down the anti-tank ditch, down there, they cross the causeway, and they enter the courtyard. And as they enter the courtyard, if you remember the picture of the Castile, they enter into the courtyard, and the front door swings open. It's like a Wild West, sort of a Western movie, and there's a couple of fire shavings sat there with an MG42 on a tripod and they open up and seven guys get hit immediately as they enter the thing. Now, Sergeant Welsh managed to break contact. He fires off some rounds. Four guys are killed, three guys are wounded, and he managed to back his way out. Because of the, because of the fog, very quickly as they go back across the causeway, they're covered uh, from view. And they manage to get back and they limp back to the C Company position report back. But that must have been absolutely terrifying. Entering that courtyard, the door literally swings open and there's a guy sat there with a machine gun. It must be terrible. Very close range, less than 20 metres. He managed to get back. Now, Sergeant Welsh reports back. He then also sends a report back himself. He moves back towards battalion headquarters because the radios aren't working to report back. And unfortunately, he's hit in the head as the fighting builds up a little bit later on. And he's Kazivak back to the UK, but unfortunately dies. Um, so this is the scenario at around about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning. Both companies are dug in. The fog is starting to lift. lift and what they're waiting for is the main uh, artillery barrage to hit before the rest of the battalion can attack through. I should just point out uh, later on in the day, and we're going to jump forward and then we're going to jump back again. Um, uh, uh, later on in the day, they do send another patrol up to the Casio to attack it, led by um, Lieutenant Jock Beatty. They get about halfway there before... The, the Germans open up again and a, a large portion of the platoon are hit in casualties and they have to extricate themselves back to the company headquarters position. It's a bit of a disaster. Now, these two companies now on those anti-tank ditches are completely exposed. And as the sun starts to come up, the Germans start to pick them off. Any movement is seen and they're fired on artillery, mortars and, and machine guns and snipers. Then the main tack comes in, and we're going to focus that in a little bit more, more detail in a minute. Um, Major Donald Hogg is commanding C Company. We talked about him earlier. He was the guy that was in charge of the ski company in the Highlands. 
his brother Colin was also a company commander, but he was wounded at the Heinsberg a couple of weeks uh, earlier. So there's a family connection. They're both from the same place, same battalion. Um, Donald Hogg was awarded the Military Cross for his actions on this day. He was tireless. He actually moved between the two anti-tank anti ditches commanding the battle under complete observation from the fire. Classic stuff. He was awarded a military cost for that. And Andrew Stewart is in charge of the uh, of A Company. They're there pinned down on that first uh, anti-tank ditch. He's awarded the military cross later on for the battle at Houseloo a couple of weeks later. Now, during the morning, while this is going on, the attacks have stalled. Everybody is pinned down. The Germans have really dominated the area. And out of the woods, C Company look back towards the woods and they see this wee fella coming down the road, a guy called Alan Hill. Now, he is the battalion medical officer. He is the medical officer of the 4th Battalion. He'd already won a military cross in Walkerin, little guy. And he comes out and he's carrying the Red Cross flag and he's moving towards the C Company position across that open ground. And unusually for the Germans, because they had a bit of a reputation with the 4th Battalion of shooting medics they had done in, in other battles they'd been involved in. He walks all the way up to C Company under observation without a shot being fired. And he says to call, uh, Donald Hogg, I'm going to go into the Castillo and see if I can help any of the guys in there. And this guy below him, uh, Private Macbeth, he is a company stretcher bearer for, for C Company. And he, again, had been working tirelessly all morning. He'd gone between the two anti-tank ditches, picking up wounded men himself, bringing them back in, looking after them. Uh, absolutely fearless, no concern for his own safety. And he says, I'm going to come with you. You can't go up there on your own because if you find somebody, you're going to need somebody to help them carry it back. So those two walk up to the Castile that had previously shot at two patrols. They open the, the causeway, they walk down, and the first person Alan Hill meets is the German doctor, the German medical officer. Mm. And I think that's why nobody fired. I think the German doctor could see it and he went, hang on a minute, don't shoot him. He's clearly a doctor. And they have a conversation for a half hour. They share pipe tobacco and they have a chat. There is no record of what they talked about. I'd love to know what they talked about. While they're doing that, Private Macbeth is cracking on and he's looking after people and they managed to bring one guy back to the company position and then to the Italian position. And going on to the next phase, and, and, and we're nearly into the sort of main part of it, we're going to hand the telling of the story over to Peter White. And of course, people that know me know that this is sort of my main area of interest. And Peter White was a platoon commander in B Company. Um, he wrote the book with the jocks, which I hope all of you have read, or if you haven't, you should do. There's some photographs here in the background. That is his map of the Broder Bosch in the background where he marked it. This is why we know so much about this area. And there's Peter after the war with his pet budgie. Um, um, he lived a, a fairly long life as an artist. Now, he picks up the story, and his description of, the of this part of the battle is really fantastic. So just to remind you, C Company and A Company are pinned down on the anti-tank ditches. And at 0800 hours, the, the divisional and the core artillery stomp goes in on the German positions. Last for half an hour. There's an apocryphal story, but when they capture one of the German sergeants, he asks to see the automatic 25 pounders because he thinks there's no way you can fire that fast and quick. Whether that's a true story or not, I've heard that a couple of times before from different people. But it just gives you an indication of what uh, Dermot was saying. The artillery during the Operation Veritable was, was immense. It was, it was really, really intensive. So at 0800 hours, B Company is going to lead the attack and they've moved into the start line just off the aerial photograph there. That line there, this is a sandy, rutty track that they use to approach. And this is the axis of advance. And they're going to cross down there, following this line here, and they're going to attack the German positions here. Moving out first is A Squadron, uh, six tanks of A Squadron, six RTR. And they're Churchill tanks closely followed by three fascines of, I've put 87 there, that's a mistake, it should be 82nd Assault Squadron Royal Engineers. Almost immediately, the minute they break cover at 0830 hours, there is an unbelievable hail of fire from all the Germans that have been sitting, waiting there on the far side of the of the thing, under observation from the Castile as well. Very quickly, two of the tanks of the 6 RTR get knocked out on the bogey wheels, so they are immobilised. And then almost immediately after that, two of them get knocked out and brew up three casualties out of, as a result of that. And the other two very quickly, after trying to engage some of the anti-tank guns, reverse back up that sandy rutty track, which Peter describes in the book. And of course, with that, one of the Fasine tanks is hit. And of course, they don't have any armor support. So they retreat back as well. 
So already the armor attack has started to bog down. It's already failed because of the weight of fire. Because again, because they had no way of knowing what the Germans until they opened fire where they were. And B Company start the advance. So they are close on the rear of the tanks and 12 platoon and 11 platoon are leading front left and front right platoons. And we'll show you what that looks like now. So this is the Sandy Rutty track. Again, if you come with me next October, we'll take you down this road. Perfectly straight track. And this looks directly towards the German positions. And you can actually see the horizon. That's the German positions. Right. So the Germans have got complete observation all the way down this into the woods. This at the time was not a tarmac track. It was sandy and rutty, really deep ruts. It was very sandy. And the vehicles were getting bogged in. And this is the attack. This is the way that the 4th Battalion attacked down. As you get towards the end of this track, you can see the German, where the German positions would be. Peter is moving down and he's got one section on the left-hand side of the road on the other side and one section on the right-hand side of the road. And he's got his rear section behind him. And Peter himself is walking down or skirting down the left-hand edge of this track. And as he gets towards the front of the, front of the woods, he is astonished. He's never seen fire like it. Tanks are burning. All of the jocks in the forward platoons of B Company, they are pinned down. You start to see lots and lots of casualties. And in fact, the first casualties start to come in. The guy on the bottom left is a guy called Tommy Gray. He's one of the platoon commanders of Living Platoon. He was a Scottish rugby player, and he's seen being carried back just past where this photograph was taken with a half of his left foot shot off by an anti-tank round. Now, you'd think for a rugby player, that's it, career over. But actually, once he survived the war, and once he recuperated, he went on to play a couple of times for Scotland and play for Northampton uh, Rugby Rugby Club. And what he would do is pack out his rugby boot with uh, rubber and cotton wool to try and to try and pack out his boot. I don't know how he managed to do it, but he carried on playing professional rugby. The other guy at the top there, that's a picture tape drawn by Peter. That's Pip Hill. He's the 12th platoon commander. He's a, 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 a bit of a veteran. He'd been in the buffs before the KOSB. And he was famous for never going into a battle with his rifle or a sten. He always had his swagger stick and a pistol. And he sees Peter and he's walking around at the front, completely oblivious to the German fire, and tips his helmet to Peter. And Peter tips his helmet back while Peter's taking cover. Uh, he is actually evacuated shortly after this with blood poisoning that day. He actually uh, got an infected cut. And the first of Peter's NCOs gets hit. That's Corporal Hepburn, the guy on the bottom right, Corporal one of the section commanders. He's seen clutching his face, blood pouring out of his face. It actually was more of a superficial wound. But as Peter's moving forward, he's trying to work out what to do. What does he do here? You can see the rest of the battalion pinned down. He hasn't in any orders what to do. So he takes cover directly in front of him, just around about this area here where my uh, little laser pointer is there. He sees two of his young, young jocks. Private Cutter and Private Walter Evans, and they've just joined the battalion. They've only been in two weeks. This is their first battle. And as he looks at them, a huge explosion erupts around them. Big puff of smoke, cloud, earth, fire everywhere. And he's obviously shocked by it, and he runs up to it, and he sees both of them lying at this crater. He looks over at Private Cutter. Now, Cutter comes round. He's actually not been hit at all, but he's so delir delirious and shocked by what's happened. He just starts to dig. His first reaction is just to start digging. And next to him, lying him in next to that crater, is young Walter Evans, 19 years old from Salford. And what happened, the mortar had struck his, um, he was carrying three two-inch mortars in their carrying case. The mortar had struck that and exploded them. So three mortars went off and it ripped his leg off at the hip, completely blown his leg away, tore his right arm off at the shoulder and, and spewed his intestines out over the floor. And Peter talks a lot about the people and he mentions everybody that dies in his platoon. He makes a point of it. But this is the one he really describes vividly. It's a very, very vivid scene if you read it in the book. Um, you can see the steam rising from his insides, which is a terrible thing. And the worst thing about it is Walter Evans is still conscious and he's staring at Peter in the eyes and he's follow his eyes are following Peter. So he's obviously conscious, but just unable to do anything. And he knows he's going to die. And Peter tries to put a tourniquet on, but as he does that, he sees his eyes roll back in his head and that's him. Young Walter Evans is killed. And it's a, such a shocking death. And you talk about the jocks. Those are the guys that are doing your fighting. you 19-year-old lads that have come in. They've been in the combat. They've been in the, the, in the front line trip for, for two weeks. They've probably had six weeks training. They've got no idea where they are, what they're doing. But yet again, they're actually getting up and they're moving forward. And of course, this is what happens. He gets killed. 
And there's young Walter Evans there. So Walter Evans was withdrawn by Peter, sketched him a couple of weeks before, just after Heinsberg. Really good looking young lad, 19 years old from Salford in Manchester, son of Annie Evans. Uh, I went up and visited Salford recently and I found his name on the memorial um, and he's buried there. That's Mook Cemetery. Not many people go and visit Mook Cemetery. It's a quite small cemetery on the Grosbeek Heights. It's between Riceville and kind of the, the more sort of fancy airborne stuff. It's a tiny little cemetery, but it's on this hillside. And, and every time I go out there, I make a point of visiting Walter in that grave because you just never know if they've ever been visited. And that, that sort of affects me. And I always make a point of going up and just popping a little cross in there and just sort of having a little think about Peter, his jocks and Walter and, and his mother, Annie. And I wonder if his mother, Annie, ever got a chance to go out and visit him. Probably not. But but it would be, be lovely to think that she did. So there, there's Walter Evans. Very powerful story, Andy. And I hate to be the... um. The Mr. Buzzkill with a change of tone, but we had a couple of questions earlier about yeah. artillery support. So just to kind yeah. of get that in there, Pedro O'Connell said, may have missed why no artillery mortar support against the castle looks more decorative than bomb proof and shell drake, of course, Mr. Artillery. Yeah. Was there a fire plan to support the attack and foos with 4th uh, KSB? Yeah, so the first answer is no, they don't fire on the, the castle to begin with. They just decide to patrol up. To, I don't know why. I think this is a huge mistake. Why they didn't either put an attack in or suppress it from the word go. But again, they've only got a few hours in the middle of the night to make this decision. It was intended that six HLI would attack the castle. Um, clearly, that was a mistake and it and resulted in the death of a lot of people. And I should imagine the CEO probably thought about that for some time afterwards. Uh, and do you um, kind yeah. of go along with Dermot that, that even though you know the 52nd haven't had, the you know, as you said, the big uh, campaign through Normandy, there is this general feeling over the winter of 44 45 of kind of a bit of despondency yeah. a bit of complacency a bit of morale is is generally within the british and canadian army is not at its mm. best yeah it's it's starting to it and actually the first time you hear a report of this is actually after afterdin and it's a brigade memo that comes down to the the battalion and says why are we having so many fatigue battle fatigue cases what's yeah. happening are they genuine and it's the first time. And they've been in combat now for four months. And I think that's that might be the time that it, that start, starts to kick in. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, artillery, they have the divisional artillery and the core artillery on that morning. There is a foo that's up with them. And he's driving a weasel. And Peter talks about how the foo drives his weasel down, realises it's absolutely chaos, and starts reversing backwards. And later on, they actually dig in a position for the foo for, uh, I can't remember the, the artillery regiment. I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, we're going to get on to Typhoon's Merrin. Thank you. Don't steal the thunder. Um, so that's Walter Evans, and that was the only jock of Peter's to die in this battle. Lots of people died in the 4th Battalion. That's his only jock that died. And, and I think it really sticks in Peter's mind. He, he wrote quite a lot about it. OK, so we're now at the morning. What's happened is the attack stalled. The company commander, Alan Innes, gets word to Peter, stay where you are, we're now going to find a position, we're going to consolidate and we're not going to attack any further. This is this is pointless. Clearly, somebody at Brigade has decided, yeah, okay, this is probably a bad idea. And so what we do is B Company and the remainder of the plumes set up in this area here. Now, this is the trench in this area. I walked into this area and that place is littered with slit trenches, bunkers, dugouts, you name it. It's all over these woods. These woods never get visited. Everybody goes to Arnhem, Nijmegen, uh, Reichswald, um, but this area, people fit, and it's covered in it. Some of them are German, some of them are British. This is a German, uh, British slit trench right where the B Company headquarters position would be. And what Alan Innes does, he says, Peter, you're going to be the far right-hand platoon of the division, and you're going to be the link between the 4th Battalion and the recce regiment there in Rempeld. So what I want you to do is I want you to dig in that corner of the woods all around the fence, and you're going to patrol that, and you're going to dominate that ground to prevent the Germans from using it. So they move back into the woods. And what they do, this track, this is the sandy rutted track in the bottom corner here. That's it there. And this path there leads into that corner of the wood where I've identified Templeton. That is where Peter's positions are. And again, if you walk in there, there's not so many much evidence of Peter's platoon positions. But further in the wood, there are some huge um, German uh, bunkers in there. And Peter actually found these bunkers and dugouts. This is one of them. And if you come with us in, uh, in October, we'll actually take you to this bunker. This is probably one of the bunkers that Peter mentions in the book, because we can't, we, it roughly aligns with where he was talking about. And so they dig in 
And now they start what's really typical of the time, static warfare. They dig their positions in, and that's going to be them for the next week. Incidentally, we talked about the Sandy Rutty track, this track here. This track becomes a real big problem for people. It's one of those things that nobody wants to cross it, but you have to cross it to get to Peter or to the recce regiment or back into the battalion headquarters. The, the, the guy there, Jock Beatty, he's the guy that led the attack, the second attack on the castle that was beaten back. He comes back in to report to the battalion from the anti-tank ditch. And as he's crossing the sandy rutty track, there's a hail of fire and he dives down into the rutty track. And he's stuck there for about half an hour. And he says to Peter later on, he says, at one point, I seriously considered putting my arm up and getting a blighty. I'd had enough at that point. You talk about morale. He couldn't take any more. He'd been stuck in that sandy rutty track. And the guy at the bottom is uh, Captain David Colville of Colville Steel family. He'd been he'd been in the um, he'd been in the Fourth Battalion since before the war. He was the two IC of C Company. He again was making his way back to battalion because the radios weren't working. If those of you can hear that's my dog getting excited because I'm talking about the second. If you can hear it in the background, um, David Colville moved across the open ground, managed to get into the woods, and as he was crossing that sandy rutty track, he was struck in the head by a sniper and. Kazivakt and he died a couple of days later. So that rutty track started being a huge. Peter used to get very stressed about it every time he went to cross it. He said it was exhilarating but terrifying at the same time. Um, and so that's there. So this is the position now, and we've talked about this before. A and C Company are still in the anti tank ditches. The plan is that the minute it gets dark on the night of the 18th, they're going to move back. But Brigade come back to them and say, no. You have to stay out there until early next morning of the 19th and um, to hold that to make sure the Germans can capture it. Can you imagine being part of those companies? You've been out there for 24 hours, cold, wet through, being shot at, loads of casualties, and you cannot extract yourself until the morning of the 19th. So they weren't very happy chappies. And then the weirdest thing happens, and Peter talks about this. He's dug into his position. He's doing his clearance patrol. And he notices the noise of four engines, four three-turner engines moving down the Goch Rempel Road from, from the uh, west to the east there. And he can see them through the trees and he's thinking, what the hell's happening? And what happened, these are ammunition tr trucks full of ammunition and petrol. The, what, the two things you don't really want to be carrying in your truck. And what had happened is they'd been told that by this point, this road would be clear and you can set up an ammunition dump around about here to support the troops as they move forward. And a military policeman had said, yeah, the road is clear. Go down there and you'll find where you're going to. And they drive just in front of the woods. And the four vehicles, just as they get in front of those woods, of course, the Germans see them. And within the space of a minute, they knock all four vehicles out. Peter can see the drivers running through the woods, through his position, back through the woods. They're terrified. Huge explosions, fireballs. These, the fireballs were like 200 feet in the air. And where A Company are on that anti-tank ditch, they can see it. They can actually see the... Um, the, the flames and they're soaked wet through and as the flames build and build the guys notice that their jackets are starting to steam and the heat is getting so much they think they might have to go over the other side of the anti-tank ditch on the german side otherwise they're going to get burnt to death thankfully it starts to die down but the guys do say it was quite nice because they started to dry out they started to warm up they've been there since sort of four in the morning it's a very odd little thing and, and i tried to find any details in the war diaries um, it's reported in the war diaries, but the 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 details aren't. There's no investigation in it. It's just a report, a story that the the RMP had sent them in the wrong direction. But clearly, somehow they got there, and they were of course knocked out within the space of a few minutes. There's my little animation just to show you four vehicles along that track. And that's it. That's the Battle of Africa. <laughs> we're not finished yet, by the way. But that is the battle. It's finished. Quite rightly, brigades come back and say, we're not going to move any further forward. This is ridiculous. We're not with the strength. The Germans are too strong. Let's hold our positions. And the good thing about Peter, or the brilliant thing about Peter White is, A, his ability to describe things in the book, but as an artist, his ability to draw. And we talk about Tommies and Jocks. This is his company, this is platoon position in that corner of the woods on the morning of the 19th, the day after. And what a brilliant example of what a British position is. You can see the jocks in the, in the trees and their forward in the forward positions. Of course, you're doing 50-50 sentry, one sleeps, one goes on sentry. You've got the classic cup of tea on a hexi stove. What they did was where they went, where they found German bunkers, they took the materials and they started to reinforce their own ones. They actually sustain artillery strikes all day for the rest of the week and into the night. Morning minis. 
uh, mortars, larger caliber artillery, and it's almost constant. And so they start to reinforce their bunkers and they start ending up making all sorts of, and the guys, guys, if you've seen the, the stuff that's going on in Ukraine uh, at the minute, you'll see how they've started to adapt the way they, to, 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 to protect against the overhead threat. They do something very similar here. And of course, Peter being an artist, he calls his whole, the ye old head wren uh, proprietor, I be well under. Of course, the jocks find that hilariously funny and they have a good laugh, but it's actually an incredibly tense period because they're on their own in all round defence in this part of the wood, and they're being bombarded constantly. But it's a great picture. It's a really good example of how Peter's descriptive powers and his artistic powers tell us a story about what the jocks are doing. And we should just mention some of the people that he mentions in the book that are important to the story. The guy on the left there is Sergeant Dickinson, the indomitable Sergeant Dickinson, his platoon sergeant when he gets into the line. Sergeant Dickinson was a D-Day veteran. He landed uh, with the Green Howards, served with the 50th Division all the way through until they were broken up in November and then came into the 52nd Lone Division as a replacement. Um, and if you're going to be a young platoon commander, Sergeant Dickinson is the sergeant you want when you first get there. He's been there, seen it, done it. He wins a military medal for his action at Heinsberg and then later on at Bremen. He eventually leaves Templeton because he goes home and leaves and ends up in a different country, company. But Peter really values that experience, that guy that just knows what he's doing. He's fought through Normandy. Nothing phases him. He just gets on with the job, and it's exactly what you want in your platoon sergeant. The guy in the middle is Frank Coots. Now, anybody who is a, a, a boarder on, on, on the live stream tonight, anybody out there who's in the Kings on Scottish Borders, knows Frank Coots. He's the brigadier. He was Peter's great friend in B Company. He was the company 2IC, and he regularly came over to Peter's position. They went off wandering the woods to try and find stuff and see what was going on. Absolutely chalk and cheese, Peter and, and, um, and Frank. Frank was loud, really uh, jolly, over the top always singing, always cracking jokes. He was a rugby player, another rugby player in the 4th Battalion that played for Scotland. And he is one of the few guys that stayed on and made a career in the army. He ended up becoming a brigadier. He'd served in Malaya and all sorts of places. And he became colonel of the regiment, the KOSB, um, before he left the army. And he ended up uh, um, heading up the Poppy Fund in Scotland. Really outgoing character. Uh, very, very different from Peter. But it's a classic example where the war brings two people that would never normally have anything to do with each other together and they find a common bond and he's Peter's really good pal in the war. And the guy on the right there is a picture by um, Peter, that's Smig Ennis, Alan Ennis, the B Company commander who you saw in the photograph right towards the start of the presentation. Company commander, absolutely solid farmer from uh, from just outside of Kelso. Uh, really great guy. Hunting horn as he crosses the Rhine. He's one of those kind of guys and really respects Peter and lets Peter command his platoon as Peter sees fit, which is which could be quite rare. Um, and really that's it. So the so the platoons settle down into the static warfare and there's a number of patrols they do. And I've just marked the patrols on the map that Peter does. He patrols in regularly in to catch up with the recce regiment. At one point, he actually walks into the recce regiment HQ and they're all asleep and he gives them an absolute rocket because if that had been a German patrol. When he comes back from that patrol, he sees a commotion in his platoon. He's challenged by one of his platoons. He gives them the password and he sees that there's two Germans stood there and they've just been captured by Sergeant Dickinson because they tried to patrol into Peter's platoon position and they actually capture them. And it turns out the officer that they capture is from the, the same town in Germany where the, the commanding officer used to go skiing in the, in the wintertime. Um, and the, the number two there, that's his patrol out and he patrols out onto the anti-tank ditch in the middle of the night. And he actually gets within about 50 yards of the German position. At one point, you can see a German lighting a cigarette and he's smoking a cigarette at night and you can see the glow and, he, and he, he gets really, really close to him when he comes back. And that is a German position. They start, they take a few more casualties from, from mortar rounds. They take a, uh, some casualties from battle fatigue, but essentially that is the 4th Battalion's battle at this point. One of the most interesting things that happens, you talked about the Castillo, did anybody shoot it with artillery? No. But what they did was, when they realized it was occupied, the next day, a swarm of uh, typhoons came roaring over the, the Afton woods and started circling and started bombarding the, the Castile with rockets. And, and this is the, the, the sketch that Peter did as he was lying there in his trench. The whole battalion got up and watched it. Even the Germans were watching it because it was such an amazing sight. And one of the best things is we've actually found a little bit of uh, footage of that, if I can get it to work. Um, let me just get it to work there. Uh, let me turn it off. Uh, let's turn it off. 
And there we go. Now, this is from a movie tone newsreel. Um, okay, let me just pause it there. We can just see the outline of the moat around there. And these are, this is gun camera footage of the typhoons attacking the Castile. Peter is about 200 meters, 300 meters away from this. And this is the first attack they did on it. And there we go. There's a typhoon. You can see the Castile that's bombing it. They attacked it about three more times over the week by um, typhoons. It's a classic movie reel there. Um, bombarded it and bombarded it. That is what the Castillo looked like afterwards. The two left photos on the left were taken in 1947, and that is the Castillo now, the one on the right. Um, it's been closed since COVID. I think it's just opened up now. You can go into it now. You can walk across the causeway, and you can walk into the courtyard. You can see the grey door in the middle. That's the door where the German machine gun was when Sergeant Wells walked into it. It's a fantastic sight to go in. It's really evocative. If you like Spang, which is the generic term for battle damage, you can see it all over. I mean, the whole yeah. thing has been destroyed. It's a really, really great place to visit and an example of what the typhoons can do. The Germans still hadn't evacuated it, though. They were still dug in and they were staying there. In fact, they were so determined when they eventually went into the castle, they found an inscription in German scored into the into the brickwork saying death or Siberia. So that was the kind of guys they were up against. Wow. Yeah, we're nearly done now. And so they dig the line and somebody asked about a forward observation officer. Um, during the time, Peter sent out a, a, a standing patrol out towards the open ground and they actually dug in a forward observation officer's uh, observation post there. This is the infantry protecting that. Great picture from Peter. It gives a real good indication of kind of what it was like to be a jock. They've got the windproof on. They've got their ammunition ready. It's the classic British Tommy. They've got their cups there. They've got the tins, everything. And they're looking across the ground, over that open ground to the enemy held ridge in the distance. And the reason, well, the reason why, and we're nearly done now, the reason why they don't decide to push any further is because of this. Because, of course, early on, on the 22nd of um, February, the Americans finally launch Operation Grenade. Now, the bit that we're looking at, and I'll just get my laser pointer up again, the bit that we're looking at is we're up here, 52nd Lone Division. There's Goch. Goch is, sorry, Goch is just up there. And, of course, Goch is captured on around about the 21st of February. I might have got that wrong, 21st of February. And on the 22nd, the Germans launch Operation Grenade. Ninth Army is, of course, next to uh, next to the British. And they start to push forward. And, of course, the Germans realise that their rear is now at, at danger, and that's what causes them to start to pull out. There's also a lot of pressure from the Canadians uh, fighting through the Hawkswald. And, of course, things are now starting to build up momentum. But really, the Americans freeing it up. And what the what the jocks don't realize is that this action here is the reason why the Germans pull out. And in fact, the Germans pull out and they don't know about it until later on. Wow. <clears throat> let me let me find me better, can you? There we go. So just to round up so we can finish off what the jocks do, uh, on the 22nd, night of the 22nd, Chaos B are relieved by 6 HLI. They move all the way back through the woods up into this area, and they spend two days in that area there in reserve. And they take time. It's the first time for weeks that they've been able to stop and take stock. And they actually end up having some informal parties. They build big dugouts. They're out of range and they actually have a, a proper relax. They sing songs. There's people with mouth organs. It's almost like a cliche. The officers get their whiskey ration through and they have a couple of whiskeys. Peter doesn't. Of course, he doesn't drink. And they also get a mobile bath unit coming out and they get to manage to have a wash and a shave. And then towards the end of the month, they move out. And they relieved the Welsh guards at this farm here at Lakey. Of course, the jocks called it Lakey because it was so wet. And then they start to move forward on the 2nd to the 3rd of March down this road on the other side of the Castile Blind Beak. And they actually send a patrol into the Castile and eventually they find it empty. 5 HLI had actually tried to, to capture it two days earlier. They sent a force of a platoon on assault boats across the moat. They get into it and 17 of them are captured, and a couple of them are killed. So the Germans were still in there around about the 25th. And eventually the 4th Battalion set up their headquarters in the Castile, of course you would do, and they finish off by patrolling into the woods, and this is where Peter does his last patrol here. Mm. And that is the end of the 4th Battalion's battle. The battle for the Rhineland isn't over. What actually happens now is they move very quickly down towards Vesel, and they're involved in the last big battle of the... of. Um, of the Rhineland battle on Houseloo, but of course that is another another tale. So I don't know how we're doing for time, Woody, but 
there's just a couple more slides just talking about yeah, some of the please, problems. Please go. We're in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah, yeah well, we're here now. Yeah, like you say, once you, once you get me going, I don't stop. Um, obviously, Peter White, White's book is a really amazing book. And it's the level of detail. It's the level of information he gives. And he gives us such an, a, a night, a, a almost dispassionate view sometimes of what it was like as a job, what it was like as a platoon commander. And I was just thinking about it, it adds, if you combine a couple of other sort of sources, you start to get a really good idea of what Tommies and Jocks are actually yeah. doing and the common themes. And 18 Platoon is the obvious one by Sidney Jerry. I mean, it's a fantastic, it's a slightly different book, but he does the similar sort of thing. He observes the the, jock, uh, the the Tommy, sorry, his platoon. He talks about his NCOs. And I think two books are really fantastic for understanding it. Uh, these two books, I know you've had Alan Alpert on, Brendan yeah. Bloody Mind, it just tells you the state of the British Army at these times. And then the classic book to the Victor of the Spoils, that actually gives you so much more information about these guys. And it's kind of a counter to the, and it's no criticism if this is your take, but the kind of, they're all heroes, the greatest generation type approach. When you start to look at as a whole, you get a much better understanding of the Tommies and the Jocks. And you also weirdly have a little bit more respect because these are like Walter Evans. He's just a young lad. He was probably works in a grocery shop before the war. He's not SAS. He's not a paratrooper. He's not SOE. He's none of that. He's just a guy that puts his pack on. He goes where he's told, and he does that every single day until the war's over. And that's kind of what the Tommies and the Jocks are about. And I think those books, if you combine those books, and of course there's many others, Rifle and Bobby would be a good example, you get such a, a much better understanding of the Jocks and the Tommies. No, absolutely. And really, yeah. sorry, go on. just whenever I'm, I'm still, although I don't, I don't wear Surge and Khaki anymore, I'm still kind of part of the Monty's Men on Facebook. Yeah. Whenever someone joins Monty Men, and Monty's Men is now, I don't know, it must be 250 people who've, yeah. who've, who've kind of deployed with them, and we saw them at We Have Ways and what have you. Yeah. Uh, that with the Jocks is, is kind of the first book they recommend on the yeah. list, and 18 Platoon as well, a few others, you know, and if you want to get into the mindset, they are they are the books to, 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 yeah. get, to get you there. And as you say, we're, we're in a world where we're kind of it, SAS, Special Forces dominates a little bit the history, and Alan Allport, as you say there, makes that point that it's Middle England or Middle Scotland that's fighting these wars. Yeah. It, isn't, it isn't necessarily steel workers and farmers. That's kind of the yeah. cliche. It is grocers and, and yeah. accountants and, and insurance clerks who are filling the ranks by 44, 45. They aren't necessarily six foot three burly guys. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. are some of them, but it's just it's middle the middle of society that aren't aren't mm. going to go for a career in the military. They aren't going to carry on in the TA after the war. Yeah. If they survive the war, they're going to go back home and just carry on the same life they had before the war. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, that, as you said, the word hero is bandied about. And we think everybody has to be kind of a Paddy Main kind of character. And, of yeah. course, they are yeah. very rare, those people. Most people just... You know, my granddad just did his job for six years in World Artillery and wasn't the he was a soldier in it in every sense of the word that he yeah. was being paid to be a soldier, but he never really had that soldier's physicality or mindset. He did yeah. a job yeah. because he was told to do a job. Yeah. And what option did they have? They didn't really have yeah. an option. That was the thing. And I just thought we'd just round off by some sort of common themes and things that we 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 pick up that Peter picks up and you can see right across the thing. We talked about the weather, we've actually already talked about the weather. Talked about battle fatigue. Peter's really good at documenting his jocks that suffer from this. And he has about four or five of them at various different points. And what's really interesting is there's no animosity towards those guys. There's no ill feeling. There's no, they just feel sorry for them. They just realize that those guys, for whatever reason, they can't either can't cope or they've got to the point where they just can't take any more. And mm -hmm. Peter deals with that. In fact, he deals with Cutter, who I mentioned, who was next to Walter when he died. What Peter does is instead of making a big thing about it, he recognises that he's having problems, so he makes him the platoon signaler. So he gives him a job to do. He sits him down next to him in his dugout. He said, right, you do the radio. And he said, it just starts to calm him down and focus him. But battle fatigue at this point was a problem. One of the platoon commanders was actually Kazivak from Afridin, uh, Lieutenant Wilson. He was a battle shock. We have different terms, obviously, now for it. And as I say, the, the battalion as a whole, we start to really struggle. They're, they're noticing lots more. And the, the, they have a regimental parade into this to talk about it. What is a proper case? When do you send somebody back? When don't you send somebody back? Slightly different from PTSD. Peter dealt, uh, suffered from PTSD, or what we recognise as PTSD for his for the rest of his life. Battle battle shock is a little bit different. It's, it's kind of a contributing factor, obviously. Talked about the enemy. 
the biggest thing by this point of war is the is the is the anger at the Germans not giving up. You know, why would they give up is the, the sort of the counter to that, but why are you still fighting? It's over. We see, and one of the things we pick up in the Lowlander is just the sheer number of bombing raids that happen at night. The amount of bombers that go over every day and they know they're getting pounding. Why are you still fighting? Why are you defending this ditch? Why are you giving your lives up? And of course, there's a whole thing about Nazi indoctrination and, uh, you know, death cult and all that sort of stuff. But it's that's a real common theme, the just frustration with the Germans. It's different from Normandy. Normandy is a different battle. This is, for God's sake, you know, what are you doing? You just, you, you, you're, you're causing yourself pain. I was going to say, um, Gandhi, they're the kind of classic wounded animal at this point, aren't they, the yeah, Germans? I mean, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people who think that after the Battle of the Bowls, that's it, the Germans are on the back foot and they're retreating mm. and nothing really happens till the E-Day. But, you know, I was when you were talking about these counterattacks the Germans do just after this, this is exactly yeah. the same time as they're doing Operation Sudwind near Budapest. Yeah. In the same, you know, they're, they are, they're coming out of... They've got nothing left. It's the but the light bulb is burning brighty, bright, <laughs> brightest before it burns out completely. Yeah. So just as... The Allies are reaching this this point of fatigue and the weather, and they're and they're just why won't you give in? The, yeah. the Third Reich are just having this final flurry of activity that's going to yeah. take even up till April. Even up till April, there's still these units still counterattacking, still holding the position yeah. by position. And I'm urging everybody here to realize that you've got to fill in in your knowledge the gap between the end of yeah. the Ardennes and VE Day. A hell of a lot happens yeah. in that three or four months. So so Peter's um, really last, vicious battles. Peter's last casualty is actually a self-inflicted wound on the 24th of April, just before they capture Bremen. A guy gets to just a couple of days before the end and he shoots himself in the foot because he, mm. he just can't take it anymore. He just can't face it anymore. And again, there's no animosity. It's just these things happen. Um, I put the T down there. Now, the first time I remember ever getting angry at a history book was uh, Stephen Ambrose's comment in his book D-Day about the reason why the British didn't take Colm was because they stopped to make tea. Well, I would suggest if you didn't have tea, the British wouldn't have done anything. So, um, yeah. And actually, it, it's it's little things like that which just give you the edge. And you were talking about earlier on, the ability to make a cup of tea when nothing else is going right is just one of those things. It's a hugely important thing. It's, it's sort of a joke, but it's not. In fact, just in the start line, literally a couple of hours before they go forward, Peter looks around and he notices one of these jocks in a little hole in the ground is brewing up a cup of tea. And the reason why is it's given him something to focus on. Yes, the tea is going to be warm and nice, but actually he's got his mind to do something. And that's the thing. On a company's position, in the middle of the day, they've been whittled down, they've been shot at all morning, they can't move. And one guy, Private Adam, just bold as brass, gets his tea, he makes a big fan song and dance about it. He doesn't try and hide from the Germans, he just gets his tea out, puts his hexman on, starts to brew himself up a cup of tea. And the morale effect, not just for him, but the whole company, they all start pissing themselves laughing. It's even mentioned in the war history book as one of the one of the funniest moments of the war. He just sits there on the anti-tank ditch and starts brewing a cup of tea. So it's, yeah, it's a joke, but actually it's those things. Very quickly, sleep. Um, Peter on the patrol back, he comes back in for one of his positions and he gets to one of his uh, forward, forward sections and the guys are both asleep in the bottom of the hole. And he takes the weapons off him and then wakes them up. And they're obviously terrified. They think this is that the Germans have got them. Peter doesn't get angry with them. Peter worked out that they'd been awake for about 95 hours. They hadn't had proper sleep for 95 hours. They had a couple of hours here and there. And he said, how can I get angry with them? How can you how can you stay awake for 95 hours? He gave them a row. He didn't charge them. And this is a constant thing for all the books. It's this sleep. Peter says he never once went on a major operation fully rested. He was always tired before he started it. And this is a common thing right the way across. And you think if you want to understand the jocks and the and the Tommies, deprive yourself of, of sleep for about three or four days and then see how you feel. Um, and I put mail as well. You know, we talk about allied supply and, and that comes up all the time. The, the supply of mail never stops, no matter what they're doing. And it's obviously a huge morale boost. And and really, I think unless, you know, anybody's got questions, by all means, I think that's pretty much it. I think I've waffled for way too long. <laughs> well, I think we've been addressing the questions as we've gone along, really, yeah. which is which is good. Um, except, of course, we'll extend the invite to come back and continue this story. Either take us to the earlier bit and go through the mountain training, mountain yeah. division aspect, or continue the story into Germany. E either way. You're very welcome, we'll and yeah, um, you know, incredible, incredible overlays, incredible graphics, incredible uh, knowledge, and it's filling in a huge gap in in our understanding of this really, really um, 
overlooked part of the well, we always talk yeah. about this channel how much of what we cover is overlooked, and yet we do also cover the the, the bits that are yeah um, covered a lot because there's always more to say about them as well. But it's it, it, these little little battles that that yeah. are perhaps not major in the sense that there's no, a lot of things happening at the That's same the time. But if you're in this battle, it's a major it's a major engagement. Yeah, yeah, and it was as I say, it was really great just seeing Dermot that's that's a little bit of the piece that I didn't know about. And now I can add this into my story about Veritable and, and maybe he's got something from it himself, just this different, and it's just these little tiny little yeah. stories and you join in the docs up. So yeah, well, thank well, you for that. He did one on Gok for us last year as well. So that yes, kind of I saw that. Exactly. Yeah, Robbie yeah, did the Operation Black Cock one. Yeah. So in a, in a weird way, we are building a little bit of a, a database about this period of the war that, as I say, yeah. so, so often gets overlooked. People just close the Battle of the Bulge and go straight to VE yeah. Day as if nothing happened in between. Yeah. And of course, a hell of a lot happened. But anyway, we'll leave it at that. And um, Andy and Merrin in the background, fantastic word, work on this. Uh, again, I urge people to go out there and, and listen to the podcast and follow you on Twitter and, and listen to when you talk here and elsewhere. Oh, thanks, Woody. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for sticking with it. <laughs> Brilliant. So Ben Main is on tomorrow, who's also in the sidebar. So Dermot, who was on this is uh, Tuesday, is in the side, or well, Monday in the sidebar. But everyone's going back to help each other and support each other. But I'll see you all again tomorrow with Ben Main when we're back into Normandy and Operation Charmwood, which is very much Ben Main's baby. So see you all tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thanks.